The central dogma of molecular biology states that DNA leads to RNA and then it leads to proteins. That makes a whole bunch of sense, right? <laughs> what it means is that your cells carry chromosomes that are made of DNA, but the DNA only holds the instructions for making a protein. That's all, just instructions. It's just info storage. There's a process called protein synthesis in which the DNA is accessed for its instructions and then the instructions are used to build a protein. So that explains the blue DNA on the picture and the purple, well it's not purple, the blue amino acid chain, but what is the RNA in this process? It's an intermediary. And RNA is used to carry the information from the DNA in the nucleus to some place in the cytoplasm where the protein's gonna be assembled according to the DNA instructions. Makes sense, right? All right, so here's an here's analogy. I have a Swedish lineage and I have my great-great-grandmother's cookbook. It's in Swedish. I, I don't speak Swedish. <laughs> I needed it translated many years ago, um, and while doing it myself, it was like incredibly slow go going. So this was back in the 2000s. I, I found a woman on the internet that did translation services for Swedish to English, but she was on the West Coast. And I, I didn't care where she was really because I was absolutely not sending her the original copy of my great grandmother's cookbook. Yeah, that wasn't gonna happen. What I did was I made a copy and I sent her the copy. She translated, translated it and she sent me back the original version. And then <laughs> I made wonderful Swedish recipes like curried egg salad and salted cod. Yeah, it's great. But the point is that I retained the original cookbook just like the DNA retains or stays in the nucleus. And I sent out a copy to be translated into this new language. It, well, RNA is that copy and it gets sent out into the cytoplasm in order to be translated from nucleic acid to amino acid. What does this all mean for you? It means that your DNA holds the instructions for the proteins that make you, you. For example, there are pigmentation genes in your chromosomes. They carry instructions for making a pigment of a certain color, and that pigment can be made and then inserted into your eyes, into your hair, into your skin for the world to actually see. Taking the instructions of DNA and making it into RNA, and then making that into an amino acid sequence, which is also called a polypeptide. It's a two-part process. First, we have to make a disposable copy of the DNA that can travel out into the nucleus and get destroyed, and we don't care. This is like me making the copy of the cookbook. And this process, making the disposable copy, is called transcription, which is a word that it just means to copy. And this is what you do when you copy someone's notes if you miss class. You transcribe their notes. More specifically, we're going to make something called mRNA, and the M stands for messenger. This is the disposable copy that's produced in transcription. This is transcription, what is taking place in the top part of this picture, transcription, going from DNA to RNA. Transcription requires that we know the base pairing rules for RNA. So just as in DNA, guanine matches with cytosine. In DNA, thymine matches with adenine and adenine, adenine matches with thymine, but it's a little bit different here for RNA. And you can see the pointy and rounded shapes. In mRNA, thymine matches with adenine. And you can see that pairing right here. You can see that pairing right here. 
and you can see that pairing right here. But in mRNA, adenine matches with uracil. And you can see that pairing right here. You can see that pairing right here. You can see that pairing in these two, right? So notice how thymine is not present in RNA. So the base pairing rules are needed to complete transcription. And the enzyme that does transcription knows these base pairing rules. This is a picture of transcription. And that big blob there is not the nucleus. Although we are going to assume that this process happens in the nucleus. That blob there is the enzyme that we need for transcription, which is RNA polymerase. Recall that there is DNA polymerase that makes more DNA. This is not it. This is RNA polymerase and it makes more RNA. It knows those base pairing rules for RNA. Transcription occurs in three steps, according to this slide. In other classes I teach, it goes through many more steps. But there are three general steps, and they all have something to do with what the RNA polymerase is doing. The first step is called initiation. If you've been to a college with sororities or fraternities, you might be familiar with this word. <laughs> um, initiation, it's not as simple as it sounds. In short, it's when DNA polymerase attaches to the, I'm sorry, in short, it's when RNA polymerase attaches to the DNA that's holding the gene that we'd ultimately like to make a copy of. There are many things that determine whether or not RNA polymerase will attach to a gene. And those details are well beyond us here in this class. We don't go into that detail. But let's do an example. When blood glucose is high, there are molecules that help RNA polymerase attach to the genes holding the instructions for insulin in the cells of your pancreas. So whether or not RNA polymerase attaches is actually determined more by the environment, the high blood glucose, um, and the need for insulin to bring that blood glucose down. The second step of transcription is called elongation. And this is the step that we are concerned with here in this class. Um, elongation deceptively looks like DNA replication with a significant difference. You're using uracil. And I go into detail in the next slide. The last step here, though, is called termination. And you would think like, oh, once you're done uh, transcribing the instructions, you'll just release the RNA polymerase. So, of course, it's not as simple as that, but we don't have to go into the incredible detail. But this is when um, the DNA itself actually has something that the RNA polymerase that can read that says, hey, stop transcribing. This is a picture of the elongation step of transcription. This big blob is RNA polymerase. We're going to assume that this picture is in the nucleus of a cell. Let's draw that. Here's a cell. Here's the nucleus. <laughs> Make sure you draw it correctly. And what's happening here is a process that's happening inside the cell. So RNA polymerase makes the RNA polymer, and that's what we're making right here. This is mRNA, and it makes it from free nucleotides that are floating around in your cells. What's happening in this picture is that RNA polymerase has broken the hydrogen bonds in DNA the DNA has been unwound in a little spot where we know there's a gene, and this is the DNA. I could extend my picture here and show you the DNA um, double helix, but we're just going to 
pretend that, or not pretend, but we're just going to assume that this is DNA that's been unwound. When we unwind the DNA, we actually have two strands of DNA, but we are going to take the sequence from both of them, like in replication, we're just going to make mRNA from one of the strands. The strand of DNA holding the gene sequence is called the template or the coding strand. Right? Coding because it holds the code of nucleotides for the protein we want to make. The other strand, which isn't present in this picture here, we would call that the non-coding strand, and it just, it just kind of hangs out. So in this picture, RNA polymerase is assembling the teal-colored strip of mRNA by calling over the right nucleotides, right? So look at this. <coughs> Excuse me. RNA polymerase encountered a thymine and it called over an adenine to pair with it. RNA polymerase encountered a cytosine and called over a guanine to pair with it. It encountered an adenine and called over a uracil to pair with it. So I feel like this is the price is right, that the RNA polymerase is like, one adenine, come on down. You are the next contestant. All right, moving on. Before leaving the nucleus, mRNA receives a cap and a tail. These are just extra nucleotides that are on either side of the transcript. You can kind of see those extra nucleotides here. And what they do, the cap and the tail, they allow enzymes in the cytoplasm of the cell to start chewing on the mRNA without actually damaging the gene that's held in the mRNA. And you can kind of see this from the bottom mRNA schematic. The coding sequence is protected by that cap of phosphates and guanines and by the tail of a bunch of adenines. So now our mRNA is ready to leave the nucleus through one of those nuclear pores and travel to a ribosome for the second step of protein synthesis that I cover in more detail in another PowerPoint. Here in this picture, you can see the ribosome. That's a ribosome. I know it looks deceptively like the polymerase molecules, enzymes. I know. But to do this, to translate the mRNA sequence into an amino acid sequence, you need a decoder ring or you need a translator. So like for my cookbook, I needed someone who knew both the Swedish and English language. Here in the ribosome, we need a molecule that can both speak nucleotide of DNA, but it can also speak amino acid sequence of proteins. And so in this process of taking the mRNA and making it into a protein, we will need a decoder ring. 